talking about evolving as an athlete or evolving as a runner or adventurer or whatever it might be, you know, the training hasn't changed that much, but nutrition has changed immensely. So needless to say, I was completely unprepared for what I was about to, to do, but it was also one of the best experiences of my life because of this sheer unknown, the sheer unknown of like going around a corner and being like, Oh my God, we're still climbing up this hill. Like I have never seen anything like this or done anything like this. And besides the extreme heat, the wind, the sandstorms, and then you're climbing up to 8,500 feet and it's getting colder. This adventure and this journey of self-discovery is was exactly what I was looking for at that stage of my life. Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I'm a registered dietitian and running coach based in New York City. My goal for this podcast, aside from having fun, of course, is to demonstrate that there is no one-size-fits-all style of eating. Rather, there are many different pathways towards individualized health and sports performance. I explore this in my athlete nutrition profiles, as well as in interviews with fellow dietitians on their areas of expertise. Welcome to episode number 40 of the Eat for Endurance podcast, featuring elite ultra runner and coach Lisa Smith Batchen. I have been trying to get this episode recorded for ages. Gosh, I, I think I contacted her like over a year ago. So I'm really excited that our schedules finally lined up for this interview and that I'm able to share it with you guys. Lisa is beyond inspiring, and not just because of the incredible things she has accomplished athletically across many, many decades. And by the way, that's a very long list that includes adventure races and Ironman events, and of course, many ultramarathons, but also because she is a trailblazer for women in endurance sports. She really was one of the first to demonstrate that women can compete alongside men and even win endurance events outright. And of course, as we know, that's been happening more and more since then. Um, I always think of Courtney Dewalter, of course, who's been winning events, just beating men, which is amazing. But Lisa was the first American to win the Marathon des Sables 150 mile stage race through the Moroccan desert and has twice won the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which if you're not familiar with it, is 135 miles through Death Valley. Lisa also is the only person to have run from Las Vegas to the summit of Mount Whitney, which is 306 miles. She's the first female to complete the quote unquote bad water quad, which is covering 584 miles. And she did that in about two weeks. And she's the first and only person to run 50 miles in 50 states in 62 days. Whew, I'm tired just thinking about that. <laughs> At 60 years young, Lisa is such a role model model for longevity in the sport of running and balancing her passion for running with other priorities in her life. She's a mom to two daughters, I can relate to that, (laughs) runs Dream Chasers Outdoor Adventures with her husband, and is passionate about sharing her love of fitness as a teacher and a coach. She also is committed to turning her passion into purpose. She's given many talks on this, by the way, and when I met her back in 2015, she gave a great lecture just on this topic. And she's raised money for those in need through her athletic pursuits on many, many occasions. As she got older and retired from racing, her runs got longer and she raised a very impressive sum of money for charity across those years. Many of her amazing feats of endurance were accomplished in her 50s, which is just incredible. We all have so much to learn from Lisa. And believe me, she drops many pearls of wisdom during this interview, so you really want to pay close attention and maybe even take some notes. I loved her energy. I loved her attitude. I just had such a great time chatting with her. So without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Lisa smith Batchen. Lisa, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. I know this interview has been very long in the making, and I really appreciate your patience as we try to line up our schedules. So thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I actually saw on social media that you recently went dog sledding, I think it was. And that apparently was an item on your bucket list that you created last year. So first of all, that looked like so much fun. But it got me thinking, you've had so many adventures in your life, which of course we'll be getting into. But it makes me really curious, what else is on that bucket list if you feel comfortable sharing? Oh, of course I do. The bucket list just keeps evolving and and growing. Um, I'd love to skydive. 
That's awesome. Yeah. And just keep exploring new, you know, adventures that they just pop up. Someone might say, hey, you want to go do this? You want to go do that? Instead of saying, I have to work. I don't have time. I don't about my kids, you know, really trying to find a way to make it happen. And some of these things have like scared the pants off me, but <laughs> it's also a great way, number one, to learn, but to be teaching students and things that like, don't be afraid to try something new. Yeah, totally. Um, is there Our anything else other than skydiving on there? Forever evolving. Ah, I want to uh, not run across the U.S. anymore, the Transcon. At 60 now, I'm like, yeah, it's okay. I'll just walk across. I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to walk right out my front door and head to the summit of Mount Whitney. That would be amazing. So things like that. They're always, you know, I love to be on my feet. I love, oh, love, love to be on my feet. And most of my bucket list adventures are really like on my feet. Absolutely. And I think I saw somewhere that you were kind of considering entering the Eco Challenge Patagonia. Is that something that's still a possibility for you? You know, I really was considering entering. I got asked, you know, about being on a team. And then when I sat down with my kids, with my family, and they're like, Mom, please don't do that. Like, please don't do that. It's right, you know, during school, it's right this, you know, we need you here. And, um, so I've really just had to start taking notice a little bit more and being a lot more present with my saying yes to things, mm. um, that I really want to do because it's so important to be present and be a part of, you know, our kids' lives and realize that, man, my daughter, Annie's a senior now. And I'm like, Whoa, how did that happen? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and to be gone for three weeks or to be to train for an eco challenge, really multi sport um, event, mm -hmm. uh, it, it just takes a lot of time, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of time. And um, I've seriously thought about their, you know, he heard their voices and said, absolutely, I'm no way, <laughs> I'm not going. Yeah, I, yeah. I can do all those adventures right here, right out my back door. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's really, and, and we're definitely going to touch on the subject of parenting and endurance sport. And I mean, you know, just how to, to juggle and balance all of those things, because even these bucket list items that you have, and maybe these are things that'll happen when your daughter graduates high school, or I don't know, maybe you have a little bit more flexibility, but still like obviously walking across the U.S. takes a long time. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a hard thing. You know, I have two very young daughters myself and it's, uh, it's hard to kind of prioritize your own goals and dreams and all those things and balancing that with the priorities of your kids and, and whatnot. So yeah, that's, a, that's something we'll definitely dig into a little bit, but let's hit rewind right now. I just, those two things were just kind of on the top of just in my mind and I wanted to just address them real fast, but let's hit rewind. I like to start these interviews by really digging into your nutrition roots. So let's go back to when you were a kid. And I don't know how much you remember if you even thought about food more than what whatever was served or whatnot, but do you remember kind of how you thought about food or the kinds of things you ate as a kid growing up? You know, honestly, I didn't. Um, I'm one of five kids and my mom, you know, was a big believer. We all eat dinner together. You eat what's put in front of you. And you eat everything on your plate. So it was one of those. And she was actually a really good cook. But some of the things that I don't eat now, you know, we ate then the way, you know, boil all the vegetables, Brussels sprouts, we were like, Ugh! you know, yeah. <laughs> how things were broiled. And I mean, Brussels sprouts are one of my absolute favorites now. And mm. my parents both grew up um, sort of on farms. So we had a lot of fresh vegetables. We, you know, which was amazing because a lot of my friends were like, oh, I thought broccoli came in a can. I thought those things came in a can. So my, you know, start of food really was healthier choices, but a lot of it was fried, boiled, you know, the way that they cooked back then. Mm. And then my mom's, you know, being on a budget and being one of five, 
she would buy like one box of uh, one box of popsicles that had six and there's five kids. So you got like one a week or, you know, so we weren't introduced to a lot of junk food or a lot of things that were really bad for us because of pretty much financial being on a budget. Um, it was more would taught you to moderation, have a popsicle or ice cream sandwich that there's only, you only get one. Yeah. And you were in Mississippi, you grew up in Mississippi. Is that right? No. I'm oh, originally what was I from, thinking? Yeah, yeah. No, you're you're close. I was born in Mississippi, lived there till I was five, and still have a lot of roots in Mississippi. But both of my parents, my dad from Louisiana, my mom from Mississippi, so our roots are all very southern, mm -hmm. and that's the way that they cooked, and that's the way that they, you know, black-eyed peas, cornbread, turnip greens. I mean, we were eating collard greens and kale long before most people even heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. The whole wellness world has turned that into a whole different thing. <laughs> oh yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but anywho. Um, yeah. And okay. So that, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. And we'll be, you know, obviously going, getting into how you started running and competing, winning races and all that. But first let's just explore sports more generally growing up. Um, my understanding is that you were pretty active as a young kid, but I, what kinds of like activities were you were you doing? I was very active as a young kid. I mean, it was sort of the we grew up where my mom would actually ring the bell when dinner was ready to come in. You I mean you went out the door first thing in the morning, mostly in the summer, and you you were gone until it was time to uh, come home for dinner. Isn't so, that amazing? Yeah, I, and I just love it. I would get yeah. on my I would get on my bike and ride it four or five miles to the local public pool, be in the pool swimming all day, swimming all day, you know, maybe have a snack or, you know, drinking water or whatever it was. I mean, using the water fountain and then knowing that I needed to get home before the bell rang. And, you know, my they just knew we were at the pool. So it was just always you just always active. Always yeah. outside, always being active. If it was playing, you know, catch the flag or what, you know, at night, throwing the balls around, just completely always being active. I grew up on a small lake. We would get up really early and go fishing and um, always on our bikes and playing softball. I mean, my mom, God love her, she pretty much tried us in every sport there was. We were so fortunate. My mom was never an athlete, never learned how to swim, but she made sure that we, each of us got to try a lot of different things um, mm. from dance to gymnastics to, you know, my brothers all played hockey, they football, gymnastics, swimming. So I feel really, really fortunate that I had the opportunity to just take part in all of these activities without ever thinking I was an athlete, you know, yeah. it was just, it was just fun. It totally. Just, and that's how sports, that's how sports should be when you're a kid, you know? Absolutely. All fun, you know, just fun and creative and try this, try that, you know, try tennis. We skated all winter, you know, figure skating, hockey. It just, I was always just a really active kid. That's um, awesome. And it That's wasn't awesome. because anyone made me. It was more like, ah, uh, you know, that was just the way I chose to be. Mm. And what made you decide you wanted to start running? Because I, I know you've spoken, you know, many times about the whole, you know, trying out for the high school cross country team and not making the team. And that was like a very, you know, momentous time or, you know, it was a huge disappointment and all that. But what kind of was, so was running to you just another thing you wanted to try or did you place more kind of, be more invested in that for some reason or yeah talk to me a little bit about that you know I think through everything I did growing up like you were either riding your bike or running and you know you didn't even know you were running you didn't sure. even you know you were you were just playing and running and running and running and then the opportunity came up some friends were trying out you know for the cross-country team and the track team I was actually on the swim team had you know never done any of that but I know, but I knew I loved to run, but I had never competed, never stepped foot on a track, 
or done any of that. And when I tried out for the, the team, I didn't make it. So I was like, what? You know, it was the first time in my life that I actually sort of felt um, defeated. Like, wow, I'm just not good enough. Because I never considered myself like, you're an athlete. Mm-hmm. You know, you're an athlete. You're an athlete. Or you're, you know, you're growing up in an athletic home or your family's very athletic. It was more that that's just the um, way that we live. Yeah. Being, yeah. being active. So. It was just very disappointing the way that I was told, like, you know, Smith, you're not on the team. And I'm like, what? You know, you're not on the team. And it it just hit me so emotionally hard. I mean, I can still, if I think about it, feel the way that I felt. Um, and sadly, I carried that on with me for several years because I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. I, and that, that was kind of my next question is, you know, the impact of not making the team. Because you were, I mean, sport was such an important part of your life. And I know that it wasn't until the end of college that you kind of broke this whole, you know, running fast or whatever you want to call it, um, that you kind of got back into it. But, you know, were you still active in college? Were you playing other sports? Were you still swimming or doing other things? Or did it really deeply affect your... No, I was, you know, obviously I carried on and, you know, I did swimming, I did some diving, and I was always just really active, still, you know, doing gymnastics on a very low level, but I'd always be like going to the gym or playing, trying to play tennis and just really, you know, staying active, but not like being on a team or taking part, playing softball, playing, you know, whatever it might mm-hmm. be. I was, I was actually not so bad at tennis. I wasn't so bad at <laughs> other things or I seriously, kept the mindset without even knowing it that, you know, I just love to do these activities and be active, but I never looked at it as um, it's a sport that you're good at or a sport that you can excel at. Um, My brothers, two of my brothers played hockey and they were actually really, really good hockey players. And I would go to all of their games through high school and was part of, you know, watching them be really good. Um, at what they did. And I never looked at myself like I was good because I didn't make a team. And, you know, that was more of a subconscious, you know, feeling that I didn't realize I really was feeling. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And was there a moment where that, because it sounds like you weren't so aware of that feeling that it was like stopping you because you're not good enough kind of thing. Like you were, as you said, carrying on and doing all these things. Um, was there a moment at, during college or maybe it manifested later where it affected you more deeply, that feeling of not being good well, enough at something or anything like you that? You know, ab- absolutely. Because I would watch other runners. I'd watch people run. I'd watch and I'd be like, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. You know, so, I mean, I would beat myself up with, you're not good enough. You know, you're yeah. not good enough. I mean, because it's incredible what your mind will will allow you to believe. Um, you know, then it hits into your self-worth. And I finally ended up, you know, I'm not even sure what my age was. Running a 5K race was my first one. And it was a, near Thanksgiving. I had never run a race. And after I crossed the finish line of this 5K race, they're like, you won, you won. I'm like, who won? Like, you won. I'm like, me? I suck. I mean, that's that's how I felt. But then I thought, like, really? I won? Like, what are you talking about? It was, you know, from such a transformation to feeling like, you know, you suck, you're no good, to like, what? I won? Um, and then I took that and I just went with it. You know, I thought, wow, I can't be, I told my mom, I said, I'm not that bad after all, I guess. I mean, I don't really know. And that's where I really started to push myself and started to run to actually train Um, for my first marathon. I mean, I just went out and did it. I ran the first, I went and ran, uh, I had my mom drop me off at the starting line of this marathon course that was happening in Lake um, County, Illinois a week before it, just to make sure I could make the distance. And I had no idea that I could do it. And then here comes the race. And 
I'm running down the finish line and people are saying, oh, you're going to Boston, you're going to Boston. And I'm like, what is a Boston? <laughs> you know, what is a Boston? Little did I know. So I was just kind of running, like didn't know what I was doing, but I was just running and I was so happy and free. And um, it just felt like that's where I was at my best, you know, with myself. Absolutely. And it's, myself. I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. So it's, you know, it's carried on all of these years later and it's, it's just helped me so much with my own coaching, my own kids and to really, you know, feel like you, you just never tell someone, you know, you're not going to make it. You didn't, you, you don't, you're not good enough. You're not, there are definitely sports and running is one of them where you can maybe not run from you know, your house to the end of your driveway, but four years later, you might be a state champion. And, you know, shame on anybody who would tell a kid that they're not good enough to make a team. I know. I mean, and we know that you are indeed a fast runner. I mean, you, your marathon PR is 248. You yeah, won it's, all yeah, these yeah. races, you it's know. It's not even about being fast. Not even that. It's really that you, you know, I started, I ended up coaching high school cross country track and there is not one person I would ever turn away from a team ever. I mean, you have no clue what somebody's ability is going to be. Yeah. You know, maybe I wasn't good enough on that day. I tried out, but I mean, give the, give people a chance to see what they can do, you know, a month later, or it's just like, you never do that to people. I don't care what the age is. It's, it really has embedded into my life the way that I work with people. Absolutely. And that really resonates with me because I never identified myself as an athlete or runner. I came from a family that wasn't that athletic. And I have you know, I was always a musician. And I remember in high school, a friend encouraged me to start running and invited me to kind of join the cross country team. And I went from, yeah, not even be able to do like a quarter mile, just you know, going around the track. To, I was, I think I was voted or they gave me like the most improved runner award or something. I, we competed in the, the state, um, cross country meet and all that. And it was such a feeling of empowerment. I remember being 16 years old and just feeling like just so incredibly powerful, just having developed this fitness and proving to myself, mostly to myself that I could do something like that. So I do really love that you're, you know, inviting so many people into the running world and people who may not believe in themselves, but maybe, and even catching them before they go through an experience like you did. So they don't have to go through years of thinking they weren't good enough. So that's awesome. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, Well, I mean, I can't, I can only imagine we all go through things like that, but it, you know, it was definitely a defining moment for me where you really don't even realize how impacted you are until it switches and it changes and you're actually like, ah, I am good at this. <laughs> you know, I could be good at this. You know, I could Absolutely. be good at this. I mean, so, I mean, everybody deserves, you know, equal opportunity. And if a kid wants to go out for a team, man, you find a place for them. You yeah. just do. You find, especially running, my gosh. I mean, I wouldn't care if you're sitting on the bench and you got to improve and improve. But, you know, there's the only way is up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you did this 5k and I, um, I watched one of your Ted talks and you kind of go through that whole story of the Turkey trot in more detail, which was awesome to to hear. And, um, but it's such like a big turning point in your life, knowing what we know now, of course, about how your running career would play out. But, um, but yeah, why don't you kind of walk us through a little bit more? I mean, you mentioned the marathon that you ran, but kind of how this whole thing unfolded with running longer distances, running ultras, at what point you kind of started running professionally um, and how the nutrition, because, you know, we are going to be talking about nutrition and how kind of the nutrition started to evolve with all of this. Cause at this point you're no longer one of five kids in your parents' house. Like you are, I'm assuming, or maybe not, I don't know you, but you're out on your own or have more control over what you're placing on your own plate. Um, So yeah, talk me through a little bit of that stuff. You know, I love the word that you used, evolving, because I think that that's where it's constantly evolving. And um, people always ask about, you know, your training, what were you doing? How did, you know, when you were back then, I was like, 
I didn't even know I was training. I mean, it was like I was just running, you know, yeah. I was running and, you know, so then, you know, there's a difference between just running and then you're training and then you're racing. And um, I don't, wouldn't even call it a professional level. I never knew I was a professional. Um, it's sort of just the evolving of how a person um, evolves into themselves daily was is just such a beautiful thing and um i went from you know the 5k to the marathon i went 5k to the marathon to run you know really working on a 10k and trying to get fast and i just i'd run a race a 10k on saturday and one on sunday i mean not many coaches are going to recommend that but that's just i was doing that because i was feeling so alive and i and i could you know i do a I started doing triathlons. The first one I did was like on this old clunker 10 speed bike and did breaststroke through the swim and then ran. And I, I won the thing and I'm like, Whoa, this is great. You know, I can't <laughs> believe I can do this. I can't believe I can do this. And I just kept going, going, going and did a lot of Ironmans and did, you know, running. And then I did not, you know, ultra running to me was just, I never heard of it. I was, I, participated in when I was 35 in the first eco challenge and mm -hmm. that was in Utah and I just so happened to hook up on a team with Mark Macy, Marshall Ulrich, Bob Haw um, who had you know Marshall and Mark Macy had had a lot of experience in ultra running and as we're going through this eco challenge in Utah, there's a lot of desert run in this thing. It's a 350 mile race. Um, and back up a little bit, I'd never even heard of anything over a marathon. I'd never heard of anyone running over 26.2 miles. So little did I know at the end of it, you know, Marshall Ulrich says, you know, you ought to run Badwater. And I said, you know, what's Badwater? And he told me, it's 135 miles through Death Valley, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you have to be kidding me. I mean, <laughs> very, like it was, it was just the most inconceivable thought that I ever could think of. And that was in April. And the race director of Badwater happened to be um, at the finish line of Eco Challenge that year. It was Matt Frederick and High Tech was the sponsor for Badwater then. Marshall introduces me to Matt and says, you know, we really should invite Lisa to come do Badwater. Um, so Marshall, you know, told him she did great through the heat and the desert and, you know, really good runner. And I'm just like, wow, listening to who is this guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> who is this guy? I really like had no, no clue, but he obviously had a lot of faith in me and confidence in me. And um, so two and a half months later, I was at the start of Badwater my first run over a marathon. Oh my, wait, Badwater was your first ultra? Oh my goodness. My, my first anything. <laughs> and wow. So, you know, That's I amazing. asked Marshall, like, how do you train for something? Like, what do you do? You know, he's like, well, you know, just wait. Marshall's so casual, you know, so mm -hmm. casual, so laid back and so confident and believing, like, you know, how hard could it be, right? Um, you know, just do an ex do some extra miles, train with a few extra clothes on and, you know, everything. I mean, we showed up with a U-Haul trailer truck to crew out of. Lo I mean, loaded with enough supplies and food to feed 200 people for a week. <laughs> and, like there was in, in that was just red Gatorade. That's all we had. Red Gatorade, jelly beans and sweet rolls and just crap. Crap, crap, crap. Uh, and I'll never forget pulling up into Death Valley to stovepipe wells to get gas and opening the door and seriously being in this state of shock of how hot it was. Like, I had no idea. And you got to realize I was living, you know, I grew up in Flatland, Chicago and New Jersey area. I was living at the time, but I mean, I had never, ever climbed any mountains. I had never done any steep anything. Um, and so that course just was 
so unbelievably hard to me that I couldn't believe I was climbing these roads that went on and on for hours. Can you just and briefly describe for my listeners who aren't familiar with Badwater? We, I mean, it's 135 miles Death Valley in July, and but just like a sense of just because you're talking about the climb and yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, well, the race starts at the lowest point in the continental United States, which is minus 282 feet below sea level, and that's called Badwater. And the race goes directly following along through Death Valley to the portal road in um, of Mount Whitney, which is at 8,500 feet. So for 135 miles, you go from the lowest point to the portal road of 8,500 feet. So you have to realize the amount of climbing that you're going to do. Mm. You know, there's the first climb is about, I don't know, 15 miles. Then there's the second one's about 18 miles. And the last climb to the finish line is truly 13.1 miles of just going up and up and up and up. So um, 8,500 feet is a long way from minus 282. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. So needless to say, I was completely unprepared for what I was about to, to do. But it was also one of the best experiences of my life. Because of this sheer unknown, the sheer unknown of like going around a corner and being like, oh my God, we're still climbing up this hill. Like I have never seen anything like this or done anything like this. And besides the extreme heat, the wind, the sandstorms, and then you're climbing up to 8,500 feet and it's getting colder. Um, it's really so indescribable to me what that event did for my for my life overall because it was just life changing. It wasn't about like, oh, I can run fast or I can, you know, do this or do that. It was more like this adventure and this journey of self-discovery is was exactly what I was looking for at that stage of my life. Mm. Um so that was what, my what year was that? Uh that was nineteen ninety five. Okay. Got yeah, it. And you was and you went on to win it in 1997 and 1998, which is amazing, right? Correct. I mean, <laughs> I seriously, not only I fell in love with the place of Death Valley, the mountains, the beauty, the everything, you know, because I kept yearning to go back there. Like, this is like my home away from home. I can't wait to go back. I can't wait to go back. And it's not, you know, there's not every race you're going to say you want to go back to. You want to go back. You want to go back. I mean, I've been back how many times that haven't even been part of a race. And um, it's really just the yearning and the longing to be back on that road that will conti has continually taught me many things over the years that yeah. I, haven't, I haven't gotten anywhere else from any other, any other place. And that's why I love Death Valley so much. I just love it. I love it, love it, love it. And um, and it's not so much the race. It's not the race. It's the journey of self-discovery that happens when you are in something for that long period of time. Absolutely. Because everything can happen and everything can change. And, you know, a huge part of that is the nutrition. You know, talking about evolving as an athlete or evolving as a runner or adventure or whatever it might be, you know, the training has, hasn't changed that much, but nutrition has changed immensely. Tell me all about it. I want to hear everything. <laughs> yeah, immensely besides like shoes and gear and, you know, holy cow. I mean, the first time, I mean, there was, you know, take salt. Well, salt was like you drank red Gatorade loaded with sugar till your mouth was, bleh. you know, you look like you had red lipstick on because that's all there was. <laughs> mm. um, and it was just basically eating junk. It's amazing how, you know, we got through. Uh, and were you eating real food at all? Like, I mean, over that long of a distance, I imagine, or I hope you were eating something other than <laughs> taking another something other than Gatorade and jelly beans. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Gatorade, jelly beans, cookies, you know, muffins, donuts. You know, start you know getting milkshakes, but things that were just what I would never do anymore, what I just wouldn't do because 
you know, you never, you didn't know you felt bad to actually feel good. Yeah. You know, and I tell people that I coach or even friends of like, you know, try this, try that, try this, try that. And that when you find the magic of what your nutrition plan should be in my, my personally is always evolving, completely evolving because every year I'm a different person. Every race is a different kind of climate or event or distance or whatever it might be of how many calories you might be able to tolerate or what you should be drinking. And, you know, there is no one size fits all. Of course. They're That's just the whole in. point of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, there's, there is no way I could do what some, you know, yeah, I have one gel every 30 minutes for a hundred miles. I'm like, you know, I, I would be done after like 10 gels because yeah. I just, I can't tolerate them. So what I learned best for myself was like the high sugary things just weren't working, but those were the, like the choices you had back then. And At what point, like, cause I mean, the 1990s were some of your, your prime racing days. I know like you continued and you're still doing these, you know, really amazing big adventures and events and such. Um, but when you were kind of more competitive or maybe it wasn't about being competitive because I know you're saying it's not necessarily about running faster the race but you were winning things so when yeah you, yeah yeah I you know so when you were like you won yeah I mean, it was competitive you won marathon yeah. to solve which is a 150 mile race through the Saharan desert in 1999 you won these bad water races you were you know placing you know so high overall not just as a woman but overall um which I also want to touch on later but you know you were competitive so you know, you were dealing with these options that were limited and didn't always work for you. Like what did nutrition look like at this time? Were you just kind of dealing with what you had? Were you trying to get creative with other solutions? Like what did that look like? You know, it, what it looked like is just, you just sort of open the refrigerator and you have what's there. Um, and really the only hydration choices were water and Gatorade. Yeah. There, there, there just wasn't a lot of choices. And so there's so many choices now. And it wasn't like I never had any sort of nutrition plan. There was never a plan. It was just like, oh, here, eat this, eat that. You know, you didn't have, you might've had a crew, but you didn't have a crew like counting your calories and seeing how much you're drinking and, you know, making sure you're getting enough sodium and all those things that are happening now where everything's like clockwork. It was Mm. basically just like, you know, oh, here, you know. I should probably eat something or eat this or eat that, eat some Fritos, Doritos, you know, it just wasn't, there was no plan, no plan, no rhyme or reason why this food worked for you or didn't work for you. You know, you might throw up, but you just keep going and you don't even think that it might be something that you ate or you probably shouldn't eat again. Um, So there was just no plan. It just, that was it. You mean jelly beans and M&Ms and, you know, things like that, that I just would use rarely now because mm-hmm. I feel like I'm, I have a plan that works for me. And the plan evolved over years. And it also evolved over a lot of trial and error and finally being like, wow, I feel really good today. I feel yeah. really good. I didn't fall apart. My stomach doesn't hurt. I, you know, then if all of a sudden think, well, what did you do? What, you know, what did you eat? What did you drink? How did that work? And start to keep a log of like things that worked, started to work for you. And, but it takes sometimes years for people to get to that. Uh, I always tell people, man, I feel like I made every mistake that there was. So why I love to coach is to help people make less mistakes. But Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that the nutrition plan that I might suggest for you that works for me will work for you. And I think there's just such a, you know, I use that word evolving like you because it is forever evolving. I, I look on Facebook sometimes, someone will write, you know, what do you eat for a, enduring a hundred mile? And I'm be like, wow, which one, <laughs> you know, which one, right? Sure. It's sure. Sort of like if it's hot or it's cold, it's, you know, I've tried Insure, I've tried Slim Fast, I've tried like all of these different drinks and products now that are out there. Noon, you know, everyone, oh, we're, everyone's drinking Noon. Well, all of a sudden, you know, I decided to give Noon a try and I thought, oh, you know, it tastes great. It's got no calories, 
all that, but why does my stomach always hurt? Um, well, I discovered there's Zorbitol, you know, mm. that, that doesn't work for me. That doesn't I work. Think for it me. Has, I think it has stevia now, or oh, maybe stevia. they it again, but yeah, you know, I, I'm with you there. I hate, I don't, but like you know what things. I mean? It's more like it's working for 95% of the people, but for some reason, you know, all these people that are using it, it's not working for me, but that was more that I had to really come to a place to realize I just don't feel good. Like if this is really working, I should feel good. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting is, I mean, here you are winning these events and just, you know, crushing it, I mean, but, but not even with a nutrition plan or nutrition that makes you feel good. Just imagine if you had kind of dialed that in earlier. I mean, obviously there weren't the options that we have now, but, um, but even you know, like, I mean, these races were in extreme conditions, you know, like Death Valley, like obviously it's crazy hot. Uh, Marathon de Sable, you're also traveling internationally and you have all the logistics and you're, isn't it, you're, you're carrying all your stuff too, right? You're carrying everything that's on your, you know, back on your pack. And, you know, that evolved is that evolved as well as like, you know, you have to carry all your own food for, you know, the six, seven days. And what are you going to take? Well, the first year I went there, I mean, I had way too much food because I was just packing, you know, candy bars and, Mm. you know, things you're never going to, you shouldn't be having anyway. And then, you know, up to my last year and now coaching people, it's just so dialed in. Uh, If you want to run well and run fast, then, you know, you're going to have specific things that you're going to eat at specific times. Now, if you're just going to go and hike it and take your time, well, of course you can bring more food and more calories and, you know, carry your, you know, bottle of Coke with you if that's what you need. Um, So, you know, different levels of how you decide you want to perform even when I was racing at my best I mean there's definitely I wanted to beat people because I was kind of running mad I wanted to beat people and even when I was beating people I still didn't feel happy it was not until years later but it was more not like beating people it was like I really had something to prove to myself and but I never all of those years of winning and winning, I never had a nutrition plan. So for me, it was when I started to have a plan that I started slowing down. But was um, that because of just being older or because I know at some point, you know, you started yeah, a family yeah, I, and that whole stuff. OK, <laughs> I, think, I think so. But it was hopefully the nutrition like, didn't slow you down. <laughs> no, no. I think it was more like, you know, sometimes the unknown is what drives people. Sometimes the unknown of you know, not knowing everything that you're going to do drives people and helps people improve. Um, but it mean, you know, I was racing and doing really well, but it doesn't mean that I was actually taking good care of myself or feeling that great, you know? So once I started feeling good with the nutrition, you know, I was way past having to beat people. So it was, you know, does that make sense? And it yeah. was like, wow. I feel so good. You know, right now I could go out and say, you know, for the 60 and over, I want to get out there and beat everybody that there is in this age group. I I have completely lost the um, desire to like step to the starting line of a race and look around to see who's there and who I'm going to beat. I would rather be in the back of the pack and walk and talk and, you know, do my own things. But I sure appreciate all of those people who do still want to do that. You know, it just, it's not, I haven't lost the love or the desire. I've just lost the desire to have to compete. And I mean, it wasn't that long ago. um, Like, I mean, I want to circle back to this time in your life to, to dig a little more into specifics and nutrition, but what you said just now about moving from that competing to being in the back of the pack reminded me of when we met in 2015, you were, um, you know, you were gearing up for um, for doing the run across America. Right. And you gave this wonderful talk. I remember at the conference about turning passion into purpose. You yeah, you're gearing up to run 3,100 miles across the country for charity, which, you know, you, as you got older, you, I know you were doing more of these like longer efforts and for charity, which is just incredible. And, but you were trying to break the overall time record. I know that unfortunately your gallbladder had other plans and that was a huge disappointment, I'm sure. But that, that was obviously you competing in a way in terms of 
breaking a record. You weren't, I mean, I know it's a little bit different, but is, I mean, do you view that as kind of that competing? Are you no longer even wanting to do things like that? Or do you view that as in kind of like a separate category? Um, I view that as the, a large turning point in my life. I view that as, you know, I work so hard and I train so hard. I really believed I could do it. I really believed, you know, I believed in myself. It was not so much ego at all. It was more like I believed that I was capable and I really wanted to try to do it. Um, but obviously, you know, the universe had different plans for me. And as much as I trained and everything was just dialed in, I mean, most people who train and plan to go across the country barely get to the starting line. Um, so I just have a lot of gratitude that I was even able to get that far, but mm -hmm. yeah, for some reason, you know, I'm in the best shape of my life, the fittest I've ever been. And on day five, like it just wasn't meant to be, you know, my body, the gallbladder, and I really have to look back at like the diet, you know, the diet, the nutrition, the, you know, I was eating clean and trying to do all these things. But then on the run, I was eating a lot of crap and a lot of, you know, your body starts to crave like a lot of fat the further you go, the things like that I wasn't eating in training. And I was trying to like blame it on that. No, I can't eat that again. Um, but, you know, it didn't work out. My gallbladder needed to come out. My mom had hers out, my sister, my brother. You know, there's things, there's no way I could have planned that any better. It just that was it. Um, yeah. You know, I'm laying there in the emergency room and the guy says, your gallbladder needs to come out. Oh, that's okay. And I said, what are you talking about? Well, can we just do this and I'll rest a day or two and we get back on the road? Um, he's like, no, I'm so sorry. That's not going to happen. I just was in such disbelief of that. And it's that forever changed me. Honestly, I, I had to go home. And my kids came home from school and they're like, mom, mom, what are you doing here? Like, you know, they had expected me to be gone for a long time. And yeah. you know, in tears, I had to tell them what, you know, what had happened. And I was needed the gallbladder out because I, and it just was such a transformational period for me in a really positive way. Um, after I felt so devastated and really defeated and let a lot of people down and, you know, all that. But once I got the gallbladder out and I started to feel good, really good, I had no idea I had felt so bad. Um, mm. And it was just really clear. It was amazing. Like, you know, the things I would have missed that my kids were part of, you know, the, I would have like, it was completely meant to be that it was not my time to do that. And I got knocked out. And, you know, it's just like, I would have missed some of these things of my kids growing up. And it makes me about cry now. <laughs> like, but that was my transit, you know, it's like, I have no desire to break any record, to be any people, to be, to be that person anymore. I do have desire to be, to do journeys and adventures and, and keep that love alive with myself. But it just was like, this is not what I need to be. I don't need my name on some side of a van. And it just wasn't me. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a sure way to knock me out, to make me realize the other side of it. Yeah. And so. I mean, when I was kind of prepping for this before, I, I remember reading, you want to try it again someday. But um, and now you say you, you want to walk, not run. And so in that sense, it's like you're really embracing the the whole adventure and the journey of it, but without that aspect of time and fast and competition and all that, but you still get that physical challenge and journey that seems to be the most meaningful part to you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it was a huge, and, you know, then there's other people who went on to, you know, to do it. And I like celebrate their successes thinking, Ooh, you know, mm -hmm. but, and I think it's okay to believe that you can do it. You can do something like that. I mean, I wouldn't have stepped up there. I know there's a lot of naysayers. There's always naysayers. But if you really believe in yourself and believe you're capable of doing something, 
and it's what you want to do, well, damn well, get out there and give it a shot and don't care what anybody says. You know, you just, because that's living your own life. Absolutely. You know, that's living your own. There is no way in the world that I have any interest or desire to ever train that hard again, you know, six, eight hours a day to try to go break anybody's anything. <laughs> I just don't. It's yeah. like, you know, well, you've off. also, I mean, you've done so many events and, and we haven't even gotten into all the things, but it's not like you hadn't already won these huge races and been this trailblazer, especially for women. I mean, you really were, you know, one of the first uh, women to prove that, you know, the, just looking at your overall placements in your races, as we t I touched upon earlier, to prove that women can truly compete alongside men, especially in endurance sports. Like, and, and you have, and, and even like when you weren't competing, you were raising like millions of dollars for charity, running just these just amazing like <laughs> distances and such. So I think it's okay for you to be like, I'm done now. <laughs> it's, you, yeah. it's not like you haven't done anything. Right. I mean, it's, it's, and you still have these bucket list items, you said. Um, I know that the 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 race or the run across America didn't end up happening, but as you said, you were training for just an insane number of hours leading up to it. And now, you know, in much later, now that there's more than red Gatorade available, what did <laughs> nutrition look like? At, you know, at this point, I'm assuming you kind of dialed in a little bit more and figured out what was working for you a bit better. Yeah, what? I, both in the everyday, because we haven't really talked about kind of what everyday eating looks like for you. And I know this will, of course, this changes all the time, I'm sure, throughout your life. But but yeah, kind of specifically as you were training to run across America and you say that you were in your great, the greatest shape of your life, what did the nutrition look like for you, both everyday eating and kind of more training specific? You know, it just, it became down to like being very repetitive um, and feeling good about it eating such as like oatmeal and berries and peanut butter for breakfast. And like, I love to graze. I feel like I'm not, don't do very well at like sitting down and eating rig, really big meals. Mm -hmm. So I came up with like every hour as that I was moving, I should have at least 150 or 200 calories. Um, and the calories really, I somehow performed best using more protein than carbohydrates. So things mm. such as avocados, string cheese, um, turkey, you know, things that gave me, I definitely feel better when I have more protein than carbohydrates. Now I know that doesn't work for everybody, but it just absolutely worked for me. Um, and drinking tons of water, you know, just lots and lots and lots of water, having Coke, believe it or not, super tired, feeling like, feeling like Coke somehow is the thing, my go-to thing when I'm tired and hot, mm -hmm. not, not drinking a whole bottle of Coke, but drinking a cup of, of Coke, but lots and lots of water. And I started drinking, um, flavored waters that were like the, what do you call it? The Like seltzer? Yeah. Like the seltzer water. I love that. Um, any vitamin water I've really started to drink the, um, emergencies that have a thousand cal, a thousand grams of mm -hmm. minerals and vitamin C drink that with water and mix it. You know, a lot of times I use half water, half, um, whatever it was, I was going to drink real juice, coconut mm -hmm. juice, real orange <laughs> juice, real like fresh squeeze, orange juice, fresh pineapple juice. I just really started to feel like real food, real fruit, real, you know, was the way for me to go. And that's pretty much how I lived my life. Like I would eat on the road what I eat every day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't foresee that for myself, it really needed to change a lot. Now, I wouldn't sit down in the middle, you know, I've got 20 miles in and sit down and eat a big, you know, kale salad. I might sit down and be taking a break and eat like a half of a turkey sandwich with veganes or mustard. Um, I'm not a really big bread eater, but when I was in an event, I would be eating bread. Yeah. You know, because 
that was part of like the carbohydrates in the substance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yogurt. I love like Ensure. Every once in a while, a bottle of Ensure because of the chocolate. And over the years, how Ensure has evolved. Evolved like from, you know, just using it in a, you know, for elderly people. Yeah. How it really has evolved to something I've used over the years, like just as a supplement drink to get calories in. Because sometimes you just don't feel like eating. Yeah. Uh, you don't feel like eating and oh, I don't feel like eating. And, but you really, if you don't get the calories in, you're not, you're going to fall apart. Absolutely. And okay. One of my favorite, favorite choices is applesauce. Mm. I would, I choose the squeezy containers yeah, of applesauce yeah. over a gel any day, any time in the heat, you know, applesauce is still goes down. Like it's cold. It's awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, and let's see, what do I want to talk about? Now? Oh, that's what I want to talk about. Um, I, I've heard you speak about keeping things fun and flexible in training and, but that you used to be more of like a rigid athlete. And maybe that was more in the 1990s or I don't know when that was, but do you feel like this kind of fun and flexible approach that applies to your nutrition as well? And my guess is yes, because you talk about kind of experimenting and all that stuff, but just kind of curious if, if, if you kind of feel like that plays into your nutrition. You know, I feel like at this stage, I'm definitely back to fun and flexible, like I was as a kid, you know, mm-hmm. fun and flexible. Hey, you want to do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give you an example, like packing for the marathon to sob would take my husband, Jay, you know, a week to pack his backpack. Take me three hours. And really? The, yeah. The reason why I know what I want to eat. I know what I'm going to take. I know exactly. So I pack it up and that's it. Cause I know it's going to work. Um, and it's like, how the heck did you do that? Because, you know, I did it last time and that worked. So being like rigid, um, I try things when I'm not in, when I wasn't in an event. I always tell people, don't try anything new when you're in an event because you have no idea how your body's going to react. But sometimes it's like your only choice. You know, you have to have different choices of things. Maybe you haven't used. Someone might offer you like, here, try this, try this, try this. But you really need to think, should I try this? Should I Mm -hmm. try this? Is it going to make me sick? I've never tried it before. Um, But I'm definitely, you know, evolved and I'm back to like the fun and flexible. Did it ever, did the rigidity ever spill over into how you ate in terms of like in more of a disordered eating way or like, was it ever kind of, would you say like bordering unhealthy or did you always feel like you were giving yourself as like much fuel as your body required? I would say there was definitely phases of my life where it was definitely unhealthy, you know, unhealthy and you know, weighing myself and never thin enough, never, you know, um, completely outgrew that phase and moved past that phase. And that, you know, food and fueling is the key to success. Um, one mm-hmm. of the very large keys to success of, you know, sustaining really sustainability for, you know, I'm, I'm 60 and I have no aches and pains. I feel, you know, I feel 40. I don't, it's amazing. you know, but really I have to say it, it is applied to like, I'm not worried about having to be too be super thin or, you know, any of that. You, you cannot starve your body of the nutrients it needs. I mean, some people do, and they're still carrying on at my age or over, but, you know, I just feel like the effects are not worth the, not worth it. I mean, to me, to me. Yeah. So, I mean, I really try to coach healthy eating athletes. I try to raise healthy eating kids. Of course, eat the cake, eat the cookies, you know, have that ice cream. I mean, you were human. Um, I'm not a restricting kind of athlete anymore. I used to, you know, don't, can't have that, can't have that, can't have that. I mean, when you tell someone they can't have it, I mean, it's like, you know, the word diet is the most sabotaging word in the book when it comes to nutrition for for myself, like, Oh my God, I'm on a diet. I can't have that. Mm. Well, 
sure you can have that. You can have it. Just don't eat the whole gallon, you know, you know, have, have your ice cream cone, you know, whatever it is. It's truly like moderation and feeling good about the food you're putting in your mouth and the food. Couldn't agree more. (laughs) You know, the food that you're eating, it's, you know, there's stress, stress, hormonal, you know, hormones, stress. There's things that trigger, you know, not just women, but also men, kids. You watch, you know, people eat when they're under stress. You know, sometimes they don't eat, sometimes they eat too much, or then they eat the wrong foods and then they feel guilty. So there's, there's so much learning. I mean, you know, you, as you know, this is what you do for your, for your profession. You're, you're learning every day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and was that something, I mean, it sounds like it, it was as, you know, we're using that word evolving a lot, but it, I mean, it yeah. sounds like, as you said, it was phases and it was something that would come in and out of your life or that you struggled with off and on. And, and at what point do you feel like you were able to, I mean, I don't know how much you're able to truly fully put something behind like that. I think we all have days and moments, right? But at what point were you able to kind of let go of that r- approach to, to eating, would you say? Was it when you, was it? after you were kind of more competitive? Was it after you could start a family? At what point in your life, out of curiosity? You know, I, I'm going to say it's definitely after being, you know, not being less competitive. I mean, mm. right, now, right now I'm in this like cycle of eating with, you know, too much sugar. Hey, have some, you know, Valentine's Day, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving. And I'm like, oh my, and I know myself that eating too much sugar just makes me feel bad makes me feel bad, drags me down. You know, I don't sleep as well, but there's also part of the aging is like, ah, I have the sugar, you know, have, you know, do that, do that. But it's, so I'm in this like place, like, all right, I've got to start cutting back on the sugar. So maybe I'm going to try to get an accountability group of people to, you know, who are feeling the same way that I am. Like, mm. you know, so I think that, like you said, you're never completely out of it. You're never yeah, completely out of it. And I think that that's perfectly normal. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's a it's a tricky balance, of, you know, or it's a fine line between like so something like sugar, because as you were saying earlier, like eat the cake, eat all these things, but don't go crazy with it. And I think it's a very common thing I hear from my clients all the time. They especially something like sugar or certain carbohydrates, they take a real all or nothing approach. And I'm always trying to encourage people to not to kind of move away from that, move away from that kind of restrict binge mentality, because that's often where we fall. You know, you restrict so long, then you go crazy when it's around um, and you don't feel good. And and we are always trying to prioritize like what makes you feel good. And some people are very sensitive and they have some a little bit of sugar and they really, truly don't feel good. But it is hard if you're feeling like you can never truly hit that balance and you're always at those two kind of extremes. Right. Um, but yeah, sugar is always, it's a big one for many people. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's a common one. Well, um, do you think, yeah. I mean, I think it's like part of the addiction. I mean, if I eat one cookie, I want 10, you know, it takes a lot of self-control to just eat one cookie, you know, so it's better to not have the one cookie than to eat one and want 10. I mean, there's a lot of self-control and mindset with people. It has to come to like, you know. Oh, I'm stressed out. I'm going to have that cookie. Okay. Mm. Well, yes, have that cookie, but then you've eaten 10 more cookies. And now that you've eaten the 10 cookies, you really feel bad. And now you're feeling guilty and feeling bad about yourself. So this, this fine line of, you know, self-control, which is definitely part of like being an athlete when you want to like be at your best is to have to continually always working on that. Yeah. And, and, yeah. I, you know, what I would say to that, um, cause that's a common thing I hear, like if I have one, I'll have all. And so then don't have, I just, it's easier not to keep it in my house. And my question to that would be, well, is that coming from a place of you feel like you're not allowed to have the cookie or the cookie is bad or the cookie makes you bad or the cookie will make me fat or like, like what is the belief surrounding the cookie? You know, cause so often people struggle with control over something because they believe that they're not allowed to have that thing. And it's, and it, that food has like a power over you in a way 
versus it just being another food. And yes, there's no argument. A cookie is not a health food. We're never going to argue that's healthy for you. Um, and it shouldn't, you know, be something that you eat all the time in huge amounts. Um, if you, well, I mean, you can, I guess, but you will, there will be consequences eventually in some way, shape or form. But that's usually like often what I explore with people and just ask them to kind of get curious about. But Anyways, we don't have to go down that hole, but that's that's often what I think about. And many people have different approaches to that. And many people do end up feeling like they can't keep certain foods in the house because they're, you know, it's hard. But the only problem with that is there will always, as you say, Valentine's Day or certain holidays, there will always be these things around. And at some point, you know, to kind of achieve peace around these foods, we have to figure that out, even though it's a hard one. And with stress, I always tell people like, Food can be a coping mechanism, but it should never be the only one, right? You know, we have to have other tools and whether it's running, and I know you yourself have spoken about, you know, suffering from clinical depression and running is, um, is you've said it's, it's running is your drug, right? And, and that's a big one to, you know, physical activity as just this outlet and, and helping with mental health and just overall well-being, right? So people turn to many different things, I think. Um, and I was going to ask you about mental health anyways, because, I mean, geez, in this pandemic, <laughs> mental health is a big one, right? Um, so I don't know. Those are kind of just a couple of my thoughts on that. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on it, on what I just said. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. It's, you know, it sometimes it's an inner struggle, you know, most often for, you know, you know, there are so many amazing healthy cookies you can eat now. That are really great <laughs> besides the cookies, but you know it comes really it's it's not about the cookie. It kind of goes on to and rolls out to other areas of your life if you're like, "I can't have that, I should mm. not have that. I mean, like, yes, you can, you could have one cookie now you need to figure out how you're going to just have the one cookie because there's I think that is such a great lesson, not just with the cookie but in life. You know, how am I going to just, you know, do one race versus 10 races or how am I going? Like you really have to get to a place of feeling um, satisfied with yourself and good about what you're doing. And yes. Yes. It, you know, in the, the cookie is a great example of of how it could be with so many different areas of life. Yeah. And, and this reminds me, actually, you've spoken a lot about MTRC, or which stands for Make the Right Choice. Yeah. And, I, and you've heard, you know, I've heard you speak of this, you, like using this instead of DNF, which for anyone not aware stands for did not finish. And of course, you're talking about with MTRC or Make the Right Choice, you're, of course, talking about, you know, listening to your body, protecting your body and um, and thinking of using that instead of you did not finish because, you know, often with DNFs, like it's this thing of frustration or anger or shame or whatever it is, but instead, no, you made the right choice. And I was kind of thinking of it as, well, making the right choice that can totally be applied to or have nutritional implications as well. And when I say right, I don't mean necessarily healthy, but really truly like what feels good to you at a particular time, which you've spoken about in this whole interview about like just experimenting, evolving and, and things changing all the time. So I think MTRC can totally be used for nutrition. I don't know. That's just like when you were talking about it, when I was again, doing some prep for this show, I was like, Oh, I can totally think of that with nutrition. <laughs> well, I like that. I like that you're using that. I mean, make the, make the right choice, made the right choice really sort of just became my own personal philosophy. And I'll give you a great example of I had one of my students was actually crewing me for a race and, uh, you know, I just wasn't feeling well. I didn't have it in me. I felt like I should be at home. Like I was so not there, you know, and I just didn't feel like dragging it out and just to keep going and to keep going. So I got in the front seat and I said, you know, I'm, I feel really good about not continuing. And she looked at me, she goes, is this where I try to talk you into not quitting? I said, no, this is where I tell you about making the right choice. This is where I tell you that, you know, I have thought about why I don't want to continue. I'm not DNFing. I don't feel bad about it. I really just, you know, feel like I'm making a right choice for myself right now, right here, right now, no regrets. Um, 
you know, go home the next day, you wake up, you're like, no regrets. Because I mean, that DNF is holds big over people. Um, yeah. So big over people and the DNF, like, you know, like having the 10 cookies or eating the whole bag of cookies. It's like you freaking failed and you failed and you failed and you failed. Um, but it's like, okay, I am going to have the one cookie, the two cookies that I'm, ma- I'm making that choice to not have any more, um, you know, or I'm making that choice that I can take the day off because I don't feel well, you know, not making a DNF or feeling bad about yourself because you took a day off or you missed a day of your training or you missed that, you know, you missed this or you missed that because that just builds up over days and years and, you know, of, of feeling this guilty, guilty feeling of not being worthy. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, and as you were talking about, like training for that run across America, like you reach the starting line. Probably, I mean, in large part, I'm sure, because you were respecting your body more. I mean, people often don't reach starting lines because they train through pain, because they don't take those days off when their bodies are telling them otherwise, you know? So making the right choice is so crucial in so many aspects of life, and particularly when it comes to to sport. So I really, I, I just really like that kind of way you talked about it. So thank you for that. Um, right, thank I want I want... I want to talk about family now, as you, of course, have two daughters. Um, what can you share about balancing, like, training and parenting? Um, I, I mean, you're, of course, a coach, and you're teaching all these classes and just juggling so many things, spreading yourself very thin, as you told me for this interview. But, you know, you're trying to be there for your kids, but you're trying not to let go of your own goals and dreams. Any kind of tips or things you want to share on that topic? You know, it it's, it is... Every day is, you know, a new day and kids as they like your years are little. Um, mm-hmm. When my kids were little, it was really just they're you know, they're two years apart, becoming incredibly creative with how am I going to keep training? Um, I wanted to make my kids you know, a, a part of what I was doing, not make it seem like they were in my way or, you know, I can't do that because I have kids. I mean, so. When I, my kids were young, I'd carry one in a backpack. I'd push one in a stroller during nap time. So I I made them part of what I was doing because, you know, selfishly, I didn't want to feel bad and, you know, the guilt that comes with it. Then as they started to get a little bit older, I pushed one, I had two chariots. I had one in the front, one in the back. So I push one and pull the other Mm -hmm. during, during nap time. So they're getting their time. I'm getting my time and we're, you know, together. It really was always about just being creative, you know, a baby monitor on, I'd be out in the driveway doing a, a workout while they're sleeping, you know? So I did a lot of things while, you know, and wrote this story one time while you were sleeping, while mm. you're sleeping, but I'm like close by the house. I can hear, I can, you know, go in and, you know, check on them because I didn't want to interrupt not being a part of their life, you know, or, you know, my husband's home and I can go out and run at four in the morning and be back by breakfast um, or go out all it, during the dark at night. I mean, you really have to think about um, how you're going to cycle your goals and your dreams and your training into being a good parent, working full time. And it, it's challenging. You, you know, parents are made to sacrifice for their kids and yeah. the kids should not have to sacrifice for the parents. And I, you know, my parents sacrificed a lot for me. I, and, you know, I definitely miss things that my kids did because of my sport. At times it absolutely becomes selfish. It, one of the, you know, ultra running, ultra training, endurance, anything takes a lot of time away. and. At this stage of my life now where I'm at, like, I am not interested in getting up at four o'clock in the morning anymore because I feel like I lived so many years sleep deprived um, because I'd get four to five hours of sleep. I'd work, I'd go to bed late, get up at four o'clock so that I could train, um, so that I could live, have a guilt-free day. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I got it all done. Now it's like, nope, I need sleep. I'm sleeping in. I'm taking better care of myself 
when I get time to exercise for myself, then I will. So I'm on no set agenda or schedule anymore. How does that I, feel? You know, it feels really good. It, it took me a long time to like allow myself to sleep in or, you know, sleeping in six o'clock, getting, you know, uh, to allow myself to do that because I'd wake up, got to train, got to train, I've got to train, I've got to get up, I've got to train to actually get out of that cycle um, and feeling like I'm making the right choice to I'm out of that cycle. I don't need mm. to train three, four hours a day anymore. I don't have, you know, have to do that. Um, but when you're doing, you know, an Ironman, you have to swim, bike, run. You have to be very rigid, swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, because those three specifics, you know, you have to do specific training. Yeah, I mean, yeah for ultra absolutely. Running or I feel like now, I mean, I could go out the front door and go for days and days if I wanted to. Doesn't mean I'm going to be fast, but I, you know, snowshoe, cross country ski, like all of the activities that I can do that I consider activities uh, I can do help me just to stay strong, to be able to do everything else in life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and I was thinking to when you were saying like you're pushing, you know, the stroller and pulling and, and doing all these things. I mean, you live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I've seen some of the pictures of the snow. Like that must be challenging at certain parts of the year. Like you can't, I mean, that really puts the, some limitations on what you can do outside with the, I mean, maybe not with the kids. I see, especially like some athletes just yeah, throw a baby in the pack, get on your skis, like, but I mean, it's, it's a different, definitely a different situation for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think there is not anybody here who has kids that doesn't like, you know, four days after they're born, they're out there. You know? <laughs> I love it. They're, I they're love out it. there. I mean, there's, there's amazing. Waiting. It really is amazing. They're, I mean, children enhance our lives. They certainly don't, um, you know, bring us down and that they just, my kids have enhanced my life so much. I can't even tell you, they, you know, they've done things with me and gone, you know, places and they continually are teaching me, you know, I don't want to be out doing all these things anymore, taking my time away from them. Yeah, no, I get you know, it. I, I, I don't get want it. to, I don't want to do that. I mean, I'm well, well past, you know, well past that. And I'm well past sacrificing, you know, staying up all night long to go out, you know, to, because I have to get a workout in. I'm perfectly fine, like doing one hour or two hours or teaching classes and never even getting to run today. I mean, I won't have time to run today. That's fine with me. Doesn't even, I'm not even thinking about it anymore. <laughs> but, you know, let's put this into context for my listeners here. I mean, obviously you're like an ultra endurance athlete and do all this stuff. I mean, you're, you're teaching all day, like fitness classes, like you are very <laughs> You're not doing your own workouts, right? But I assume you're still quite active, even on the days you're not running. Or I think like the other day I saw on social media, like you would just walked for two and a half hours and like found all this change on the ground or something. Yeah, I did. Yeah, so I you're so active. Dollars. Yeah, I that's amazing, by the way. Dollars. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's good. Um, so yeah, just a little, just a little context for my listeners. You're still oh, very no. active. I, th- I know it's all relative for you though, right? Um I want well, to when I'm when I'm teaching classes, I'm teaching. Mm-hmm. You know, I might show okay. them how to do an act. I do not participate in my own class. I'm uh, really okay. a form critic, and you know all that. But it's I'm absolutely not training for anything. I'm training just to be happy and feel good, and that, that's it. Totally. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about women in sports? Just, you know, your own experience being this trailblazer and inspiring countless other women, um, you know, and, and just kind of anything you'd like to say about all these women out there, including yourself, who are accomplishing such great things. Um, anything, especially with daughters and role modeling, all of that. But again, you, I mean, you really were one of the first to show that, you know, women are competing with men, especially in these long distances. And I know Courtney Dewalter is, you know, she's won outright, you know, races and there are lots of other women out there coming after you, but I just, I don't know, anything you want to kind of say about that? You know, it's, it's really remarkable to, to be in this place in life and think like, geez, how did I get here? Right. You guys, 
uh, you know, to be a trailblazer and to actually sit back and think, wow, maybe I was, you know, you were. <laughs> like, you're a legend. I'm like, well, how do you become a legend? What is, I mean, because things go so quickly, so, so quickly. And, you know, my greatest advice to people is don't rush it. Don't run away from things. Don't, you know, run to things that are healthy and positive and worthy. Um, and never, ever let anybody tell you you can't do something or you're not capable or you're not good enough. You know, step up to the plate, believe in yourself, you know, give it your all. I mean, you never, ever want to live with regrets or I wish I would have or I should have or I could have. I mean, because you can. We really can. And women have, you know, I look at Maggie and I look at like, I love following these, you know, young people and let alone young, but you know, people older than me that are just crushing it. Yeah. You know, there, there is no limitations. There is nothing that can limit you unless you truly allow it to, you know, people who have massive disabilities and illnesses and all kinds of challenges, you know, that I've not had are crushing it. And there's so much out there now that can be achieved that there should not be any reason why anyone would want to not do something that's on their heart. I mean, you just don't wait for it to come knocking at your door. You got to go after it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I know you and one of my past guests, Marshall Ulrich, are good buddies, and you guys have known each other for a really long time. And I want to ask you one of the same questions that I asked him, as you are both such incredible role models and models in terms of longevity in the sport. So like Marshall, you accomplish these amazing feats of endurance well into your 50s, such as the Badwater Quad, um, which was just incredible. And as you enter your 60s, you're obviously still going strong and just doing all sorts of great stuff. So yeah, what tips do you have for my listeners in terms of just remaining physically active, healthy and strong, especially in endurance sports as you age? You really just have to take care of yourself. I mean, there's don't put yourself last. I mean, us, you know, mothers are always putting themselves last. You know, I'll wait till tomorrow. I'll wait till next year. I'll wait till next month. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. I mean, don't wait. Don't wait. There is always a way to work things out. I mean, because it's like I woke up and here I am 60. I'm like, how the heck did I get here? Um, you know, but I can also look back and be like, man, I have done a lot. I have lived a really great life because I'm not sitting around waiting and, you know, don't wait to retire. Don't wait till the kids are out of school. I mean, there's so many things that you can do like today, right now to start towards a path. I mean, a lot of people don't have a dream. They don't know what they want to do. I mean, that's one of my greatest parts of coaching is like, what do you mean? Well, we're going to find you something, you know, what excites you? It doesn't have to be running or triathlons. I mean, especially with nutrition. I mean, nutrition is an everyday event that happens in your life. Everyday event that you are constantly working on, thriving on, you know, where you, Claire, can, you know, just can help so many people that have no idea they're not even feeling their best. Yeah. I mean, I, I know what it's like to be at my worst and I know what it's like to be at my best. And to know that is actually to go through experiences um, and you gain wisdom. I feel like us older, wiser people are, you know, women wise with wisdom, right? That's kind of a chapter I want to write one day. It's just like, as you age, you get wiser, you have more wisdom and, you know, be willing to take chances and let fear guide you sometimes to be like, oh, here's my friend. I'm afraid to do that. Well, don't, don't let it hold you back. Absolutely. Like, you know, I'm 60. I'd love to go do six crossings of Death Valley. You know, why not? Love it. Right? Why I not? Love, and I'd you would to. totally crush it. <laughs> I don't even care if I'd crush it, but, you know, I'm going to wait till my kids are a little older or, you know, they're, they are older. I mean, Annie's graduating. My God, it's like, ah. Um, but, Amazing. you know, I visualize one day that when I want to walk across, you know, my kids might come out and crew me and we, we do things, you know, I, you know, together that, but you never know, you never know, but you, you got to keep planning. You have to keep dreaming. And if things don't work out, do not even regret it because something else, something better is waiting around the corner. You have no idea what it's going to be. 
That's awesome. Thank you for that. And by the way, you haven't written a book, have you? You know, I have started a few times. I keep saying you need I'm to write a book, to... Lisa. You need to write a I... book. <laughs> <laughs> I would Seriously. like to. I mean, I know I've started, I've started, I've started, and you know, never it. finished. <laughs> and then I think, why would anybody want to read it? Uh, oh my you know, goodness, are you kidding? You? No, I'm not kidding. But, book. People would read you know? your book. You've just provided so many amazing pieces of wisdom in this interview that are so inspirational, and you've lived such this full life. I would love to see it all laid out in a book. Really, truly, you should go for it. Well, that's some good coaching right there. Claire. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's wrap things up. Let's wrap things up with my quick bites question. And then I know you got to be out of here. Um, so what is your favorite meal or snack when you're in a hurry? Favorite meal or snack when I'm in a hurry is I grab little bags that I've already had pre-made of um, blueberries, cranberries, cashews, and they're just, that's what I have as snacks. I just grab it and go raw almonds, apples. Great. And what yeah. about when you're not in a hurry? Oh, I do love to cook. Awesome. I lo- yeah. I love to cook. I love, you know, sweet potatoes and baking, you know, chicken and just fish. I mean, I really do love food and I love to cook, but I don't like to cook if I'm going to eat by myself or if it, no one's going to, you know, know if they're going to like it or not. I mean, there's so many quick meals that you can make. I love to use my crock pot. Quite mm, often. Yeah. You know, awesome. you just throw the kitchen sink in there. Yeah, absolutely. I love making chilies. It's just like you could put anything in there. <laughs> Uh, um, white bean chicken chili mm-hmm. is like Ooh, my favorite. Yum. Lots of cilantro and spinach. Yum. Delish. What's your favorite post-race meal or snack or post-event? My post-race, well, it used to be like, hurry up and get me a cheeseburger. Um, mm-hmm. Still might be. You know, it's it's hard to know, but I love like just after something really big is your body's just craving fat. I know mine is. Yeah. Um, Real big, like cheese omelet with tons of vegetables. Awesome. Yum. And what about your biggest cooking catastrophe? (laughs) Oh, my God. A turkey that I tried to make in cooking it all, like cooking it on 200 all night long. (laughs) Being told that it would like fall off the bone. Oh, my God. I should send you a picture of it. It completely was like disintegrated. Oh, gosh. (laughs) The poor thing. Whoops. It was awful. I mean, my, my family still laughs about it. I'm like, I can't wait to get up and open the pan with a turkey. And it was like, oh, my, what, is, oh, what, have, you, no. what have you done? My uncle said, that looks like roadkill. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, it was really a disaster. Yikes. A complete disaster. Well, you learned your lesson. <laughs> yeah, I what definitely is, did. What is your favorite beverage? My favorite is seltzer water. Mm, drink, yeah. drink it all day. What is your favorite dessert or ice cream flavor? If you chocolate, enjoy it, anything chocolate, chocolate, peanut mm. butter. Yum. And last but not least, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle. Shoes, jog bra, sunglasses. Perfect. I mean, you basically just go out the, with those three things. <laughs> Yeah. You might get some looks from the, from the neighbors, but you know. <laughs> awesome. 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 Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Where can everyone find you online if they want to learn more? On my very not updated website, <laughs> www.dreamchaserevents.com. I'm also on Instagram, Coach Lisa Batchen. Awesome. And you're on Facebook too, right? I'm on Facebook. I try to get, trying to dwindle away from it, but it's not. I know. Enough. I yeah. know. I'm trying to back. Away I use it. Yeah. Too. I try to use it as a source of, um, you know, learning and inspiration. There's so many great people posting all kinds of great things, but then there's also a lot of drama on Facebook. Yes. And Instagram is a very happy place. Yes. That's yes. I hear you. <laughs> 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. It was such a joy finally be able to talk to you. I'm really glad we finally were able to schedule this and get this on the books. And um, I just wish you the best of luck with everything and a happy graduation for your daughter. It's very exciting. And yeah, just all the best. Uh, thank you. And I wish you all the best too. And well, let's be in touch again soon. Sounds good. Okay. So what did you all think? Isn't Lisa amazing? I love her so much. She was so much fun to talk to. I could have talked to her for so much longer, as I feel with many of my guests, of course. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and for sharing your athletic and nutrition story with us. I know I'm not alone when I say, hint, hint, we can't wait to read your book. <laughs> no pressure, though. Just kidding. Um, no, seriously, though, write a book. We would love to read it. Anyways, thank you all for your support and continuing to listen to the show. It is so much appreciated. As I always say, if you haven't already given me a rating and review on iTunes and you are enjoying the show or just want to give me feedback, would love for you to go on to the iTunes page and visit that and uh, give me some stars and a review and whatever you feel like doing. And of course, always feel free to get in touch with me. I, uh, Even though I'm moving to California, I'm still accepting new clients, although taking a little time off to get settled, but I will be accepting new clients again later in April. And I uh, would love to hear from you um, if you have any topic or guest requests or anything like that. Just an FYI, I probably will be taking a little time off from the podcast. I don't have any more guests lined up just yet, although definitely some things in the works, but nothing scheduled as I really do need a little time to focus on client work and just getting settled in California. But don't worry, I'll be back soon. It won't be too long. I'll try not to take too much time off this time. But of course, if you haven't already listened to my other 39 episodes, they're all on there and ready for you to check out. All right, guys, have a good one. And I look forward to, to talking to you all soon.